The ancestors are coming. We've been talking about this a lot. Getting ready, making sure you have everything set up. Make sure you have your altars planned out. Make sure that you have any offerings that you want to have out. What do you do when they're actually there? Well, there's this wonderful idea called cosmic hospitality. It's how we should respond to all things, whether they're spirits or flesh or mountains or rivers or planets. It's a really interesting idea. We're going to talk about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie, and I have allergies. I feel like it's like you write in voice. I'm really, really, really weird. If so, I apologize. They've been flaring up for a while, and they're really hitting me hard this year. I am also a Christopher Fagan Druid and a priest of Bridget. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian. I'm a kumquat. I, too, breathe the same air that Charlie breathes. While the allergies are raging so bad this year, We've had friends going to the doctor because they were sure they'd caught some exotic disease. And they're like, oh, we tested you for everything. It's just allergies. I know I went through the whole mental panic cycle. If I caught something, went down the list of possibilities and realized it all pointed to allergies. It was just so bad. It felt like I was sick. So if we sound a little sniffly, then that's why hopefully this will pass in a week or three because it looks like we're going to have a cycle this year. Let's get into what we're actually talking about, which is the ancestors. What do you actually do when they're there, and what is cosmic hospitality? Cosmic hospitality is the general notion that we should be welcoming, gracious, and respectful to everything that we meet. Thing is a very important word there. Everything that we meet. Because we never know what effect it will have on us. You see, the industrial age and the imperial ages that proceeded and continued through it saw the world as something to plunder. They saw the world as something that it, they could extract resources from and didn't really care about, oh, pesky things like ethics, morality, sustainability, general survival. This just wasn't high on their list of, of things. Cosmic hospitality is the exact opposite of this because we now know how much we rely on the bees, the trees, the rivers, the clouds, the mountains, the various biomes that exist on Earth. The more we study, the more we're coming to understand this amazing interconnectedness between everything. So approaching the world and everything that we encounter with this kind of gracious, respectful attitude, one, helps keep us from making the mistakes of the past, but also helps us to establish something we talk about a lot on this podcast, and that is right relationship with those things. This applies equally to the spirits. We've talked a lot about not upsetting the other crowd in ways that you can upset the other crowd. But this also works with our ancestors and our ancestral lines. We did an entire episode on this, if you want to go back and check it out, where we talked about our three ancestral lines that everybody has. You have your ancestors of blood, who are your parents and your parents, parents, your parents, 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 all the way back. You have your ancestors of milk, who are the people who have nourished you, both personally or through their poetry, writing, art, what have you. And you have your ancestors of land, who are the people who lived where you are now. And you may have never met them or anyone from their people, group, but they still have an effect. Learning to have this cosmic hospitality for all of our ancestors helps us to live in accord with so. Now, I want to say right off the bat, this does not mean that we welcome all of our ancestors in. If you've listened to our previous episodes, you know that we have some ancestors by name who are not allowed to visit us during the festivals. They are specifically barred, cannot enter, nope. That is fine because hospitality is a two-way street. If we say you cannot enter and you try to enter anyway, you are the one not being hospitable, not us. That's something I think that is easily forgotten in the world that we live in. One of the biggest things in hospitality is setting those ground rules, those standards, the standards by which you're going to hold yourself and anyone else in that space that has been established. That's something I think a lot of people miss or forget or lose track of. So if that standard is 
Like, I don't want any murderers acceptable in this space. I mean, you yourself, do not do the murdering. And anybody does the murdering wanting to enter the space, they're not welcome. And that's okay. It's okay to have those standards. Now, there, there is a thing of going too far. And making sure that we're being very honest and upfront with that. But that's just the beginning of hospitality. If we're going to welcome the first of our ancestors into our home, we need to make space for them. This one is what an ancestor altar is used for. Remember, as we said in our episode on altars for Solid, and I will keep repeating until people hear me on this, altars are for you, but they're also for your guests. They're like a buffet table. If you put them there so that you can go grab canopies, what canopies, while you're trying to entertain at the party, but also anybody else can go and grab a drink in a canopy from the buffet while they are at the party. So having something like that set up is a good thing to do. Setting aside a portion of the meal on a plate for the ancestors, setting a place for them at the table is a very traditional way of being well from and powerful. This might feel weird to people that aren't used to doing this, but talk to them, acknowledge them, not just through formalized ritualized prayer, which if that's something that you feel called to do, by all means, do it. Life so says, light a candle, say your peace. That's great. I know that there are certain ancestors that I've had that were very interested in certain aspects of my life. I have one grandmother who loved all of my thinkings and drawings, as said. I always say a little prayer every time I finish something like that, because I know that's something that she would be interested in. I have a great aunt who I knew was very interested in my storytelling and in my fiction. So every time I write a story, I make sure to let her know. Just on a basic psychological level, this helps to keep us connected to them and their memory and helps us to stay grounded in the knowledge that people have cared for us. Because it's easy sometimes to forget that. But it also, somebody who does believe in this spiritual woo-woo of everything, connects us to them specifically. There are times when I'm working on a poem and I'm trying to emulate the style of a poet that I love, that I will invoke them like Homer calling a muse because I really want that poetic style. And they are an ancestor of, on my milk line. They have inspired me. They have nurtured me. They have gift given me the tools to become who and what I am today. Now, remember, they may not know this, and they may not care. And since things true for your ancestors of blood, by the way, not every ancestor is wanting to connect to all of the children. All of the think of it like with ones that are still living and around in your lives, that same guidelines like they're going to ha each have their own interests they're going to each have their own involvement they're going to care or not care just for whether they're alive or passed on it doesn't really change when dealing with your ancestors unlike any of the other spirits that you might be given with don't be surprised if you don't hear back from them with other spirits especially some of the more some of the more local nature spirits that we deal with they're they're here when we're talking to the spirit of the river, well, the river is right there. The likelihood that the spirit will hear and answer is higher. When dealing with angels, angels are, for the most part, just embodiments of various powers and energies. So as long as there is compassion in your life, Michael will probably answer any of you prayer. Because Michael is the archangel of compassion, no matter what anybody tries to tell you. Raphael is the archangel of healing. They are present because those energies are present. Ancestors, like the other crowd, have lives of their own. They're not sitting around on a shelf somewhere, like in Mulan, waiting for you to light incense or to think about them. They are doing other things. They may have moved on to another life. They may be exploring the cosmos. It doesn't mean that they still can't help you. See, I was taught, and I tend to believe this, that one of the reasons we don't remember our previous lives so well is that before we come back, we hand off our memories to a spirit that will basically take care of our loved ones while we're gone. That there's a cloud of spirits that kind of follow us around in life and that they will take care of our, our descendants so we don't have to worry about them while we're off doing something else. But you never know if they're going to show up. And that's fine. I think we put too much focus on, well, the spell didn't work, so my power is weak or... 
I did the ritual and I didn't have this elaborate dream. It didn't have a vision that broke the heavens and I saw the secret order of all things. There's a craving for spiritual experiences on the level of what we see in movies, books, and TV shows. I like to remind people, magic is a subtle art. Can you have those kind of earth-shattering visions? Yes, they, they can happen. You, you can't predict them and you can't force them to happen. They're rare. They're very rare. Most of what you're going to be experiencing is the, are these small things, these little things. A big part of hospitality is making sure your expectations are right. If you're throwing a kid's birthday party, sitting around and discussing the oeuvre of a talented modern painter, it's probably not what the kids are going to want to do. They're not going to want to talk about the one-man show that you saw last week and this. It was a kids related one or something, right? And I think we, we miss that when we are thinking about dealing with spirits and the ancestors that we have so fetishized the spiritual and that we feel like they're just waiting for us. We are the active a agents of the universe. We are the main character of the story and we're not, you know, if you're throwing a party with a lot of a certain kind of music and your ancestors don't like that kind of music and made that known in life. They probably won't hang out at your party. They'll probably be like, well, that, that music got turned on and they'll leave. And that's fine. Is you have to have your expectations set in just the right way for how you're going to deal with these people. Because they're not something preserved in glass. Our ability to grow, develop, change doesn't end when we do. And you have to be ready for that. When you're thinking about how to be hospitable to your ancestors when they've arrived or when they're in the house, think about your living room. Where are you watching television? Where are you playing video games? Where are you hanging out most of the time? Because let's face it, we're facing a three day island. We're not going to be in a profound ritual space for three days. I know some people will try. Good luck and God Godspeed. I would love to hear about it. <laughs> love to hear about it. Tell us how you coped when you finally burned out. So when you're not in these highly ritualized spaces, Think about how you want to incorporate them into the rest of your day. If your ancestors are coming to visit, how would you treat them as a house guest? I had a friend, one of my very first witchy friends, had a spare room in her house. She would go in and she would prepare like any time she had a guest coming to visit. She would freshen up the linens in the spare room, fluff the pillows, get everything just so. If she had anything that were her ancestors, for example, like hairbrushes or jewelry or anything, she would lay them out on the dresser and stuff in there so that they were in there for them. The room was set up for them so that they had a space that they could go and be in. She would also designate one of the chairs in her living room. Like this is the ancestor chair. She actually went so far as she, she was really good with fiber craft and wove basically a rocker for them. That was the ancestor's chair. No one was ever allowed to sit in that chair because anytime the ancestors wanted to come to visit, that was their chair that they could come and hang out in which I think is a beautiful idea. It's what I've played around with and I've never really had a space that I could just dedicate a chair for no one to ever sit in. I love the idea of that. She incorporated these practices into her life in a way that I am still 30 years later trying to do in a way that I am happy with because the difference between our practice, our craft, a lot of other people's religions is the craft is not a Sunday event. It's not something that you go to the special building and you listen to the guy, because let's face it, it's usually a guy, get up at the special podium, give his special speech, then you go home and then you did your duties. If you're actually practicing the craft, it is an all the time thing. The magic is happening, and we know this because anytime we're doing anything with intention, whether that's conscious or unconscious attention, that is the weaving of magic. Whether you're just sitting there crocheting or sitting there petting your cat, this is, in fact, a magical experience. Magic is being done. Now, you don't have to be overly conscious or self-conscious about these times and dedicate the energies to blah, 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 blah. But it's knowing that that energy is always being altered and played with and manipulated through all of the actions of our lives. And that's equally true if we're going to have a vibrant ancestor practice. They don't just come on Sawa or Bielten. Some of our ancestors that are closest to us will come a lot. I have a great, great grandmother that I never met that shows up in my dreams. I, I feel her presence in the house. I feel like I have a 
interesting relationship with her because I never met her. I met my great grandparents, but I never met my great grandmother's mother, except for maybe this way I did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so try to figure out ways to incorporate that sense of we have a guest in the house. We have a place for them here. How are they? How are we living with them? It's something that I don't think a lot of us who are new to the craft or who have converted in, you know, sort of practicing the craft have really given a lot of thought to it. Because the worst thing that we can do from my perspective, from just a general hospitality point of view is welcome to the house. You are so gracious to be here. Uh, there's food over on the table. Uh, I'm going to go ignore you now for like three days. Yeah. That, that's not hospitality. For me, uh, one of the ways I figure out what those standards are is remembering one, doing unto others as I would have them do unto me. That is twofold. How would I want to be treated when I'm a guest somewhere? Or if I'm excited enough to go to someone's party, I guess it's a better way to say it. How would I want to be treated at that party? And also remembering on the flip side, if I were the host of a party, how would I want my guests to behave and how would I want to behave in relationship to that? Remembering that, that doing on others as you would have them do unto you aspect of that, putting yourself in those different roles and what your expectations would be in that. Because as a guest, I wouldn't expect the host to dolt overly constantly and, and have to give me full attention all the time. That would actually be annoying. I would tire of the party very quickly if that happened. Oh, yeah. And so as a host, I try to remember, don't do that to the guests. I got to give them their space and let them enjoy the space itself and craft the environment. And the other one is remember, you know, you're going to be judged on those standards by which you judge. So once again, when you're setting those rules, setting those standards for the hospitality, part of that whole consistency thing, remembering that, that you're being judged by those same ones. So you, know, you can't be too exclusive, but you can't be too inclusive at the same time. That was actually like leads really well into like one of my biggest things for the holiday in general and for uh, ancestor veneration because from the comments, I feel like for some people, this is going to be their first year really getting to do that. Do not create a situation in your life reminiscent of a sitcom Thanksgiving or Christmas episode. I feel like that covers a lot of territory and I think a lot of people have seen enough sitcoms to maybe get that, the, all of the references I'm trying to make with that. The food doesn't have to be perfect. Perfection is something we strive for, but better is what we always try to get, right? As I so, like to say, is it keto? Is it all good? Yeah. If it's all good, it's good. If you can make it a little bit better, great. Make it a little mm -hmm. bit better, but if it's all good, and that's all you got? That's great. You did it. Congratulations. Don't worry about being always on. You are not the host of a reality TV show. You're not on a reality TV show, at least if you are. Actually, if you are on a reality TV show and you're listening to this, say hi. Like, you can send me a DM on something. Like, I, I'd be fascinated to find out which one. But I would guess that the vast majority of our audience are not off a reality show, right? I would love to hear their perspective on what it's like. Because it's a whole different level in hosting with different expectations and standards. And it would be fascinating to hear that actual experience. So, yeah. Because I think we get into this weird place, especially when we're talking about spirits, that either we feel like we're in a zoo and they're watching us. Or they're in a zoo and we're... or, or Maybe in an outpatient, in a, some kind of a hospital setting or something. I don't know. We're visiting them or they're just watching. And I can't stress this enough. Spirits have their own lives. With the exception of angels, which generally speaking do not. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but most angels are just, like I said, embodiments of energy. They come into existence and they're gone. Like they're very unitask or spirits for the most part. They have their own lives. They're not here to walk through the human exhibit at Epcot. I have been in some situations where I felt like, okay, the ancestors are here. Everybody behaves. I get where some of that instinct comes from because maybe you had a parent or a grandparent that was a bit of a taskmaster or what have you. Again, you get to choose whether or not they get to come in. At this time, time of year or any time, they're not here to judge us. This isn't a cosmic parade where you're like, Ancestors, here is my life. Please approve and do not curse. Because definitely, if you have ancestors that are like that, they should be on the naughty list. They should be persona non grata, not allowed it. Because that is not right relationship. So yeah, we've talked about offerings. 
We've talked about making the sacred space, but also just making that space in and of yourself. We're celebrating the third quarter May, which is the moon of the Via Positiva. It is one of the great themes of the Via Positiva is cosmic hospitality. This often gets limited to just thinking about nature. I feel like I have to stress this over and over and over again. Spirits are a part of nature. I do not believe in the supernatural. I think that everything is natural and that's where everybody gets things wrong. Because if, if you think that spirits are supernatural, then that means spirits can break the laws of nature. If you think magic is supernatural, you believe that magic can break the laws of nature. It really can't. It can twist. It can very much Neo, there is no spoon, the laws of nature and work some loopholes for you, but you're not really going to be breaking any of it. And so anytime we are sitting there trying to connect to nature, just remember that's not just the birds in the sky and the fish in the water and the bu bugs and the critters running around. That's also the spirits that are ever present everywhere you go all the time, all around us. And having a good relationship with them really does help make the world a better place. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, even with the allergies. If you did, you might want to hit the like, subscribe. We do this five times a week, and we have a lot of really interesting content coming out. If you have any advice on how you are, or stories, if you have any advice or stories about how you are hospitable to your ancestors, I would love to hear them in the chat. I would love to hear them. Please leave a comment. But if you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, if you're listening to us anywhere else, they says you leave a comment, uh, you can, but they will not notify us. So take that comment and head over to creationsfast.com. Click on the chat and you can leave your comment there. We will be able to see it and have a conversation with you because I'd love to know how are you doing this? Especially because I'm trying to be as open as I can. I don't want to be too proscriptive. And also I don't want to step on the toes of, I know how some of my creative friends and Chinese friends and other people of other cultures do these kinds of things, but those are not my cultural practices. And I do my best not to be appropriative of other people's cultures. But if you do things differently, please share. I, I think it's beneficial to us all to learn. While you're over there, if you happen to have some money, you can pass our way. You could join as a member. It really does help us out. It helps us keep a roof over our head, feed our table and the power on. You can also support us at Kofi and Patreon. I am CU Dorset on both. And until next time, may the one life remind you of the deep connection that you have with your ancestors and to remind you that one day you will walk amongst them. Amen. Amen. Amen.